opportunity, chances to come here and uh, present some of the work that we're doing at the University of Illinois. Um, this morning I've spoken at HR, and I was actually really enjoying the program. Um, so the first thing I'll point out is that my title has kind of changed um, to reflect my evolving view of what's happening in these materials. But the point is the same. He used to say, uh, bad pulse and ice and under man, that's non bad pulse and ice. Um, the point is the same. The overarching goal of my talk is kind of raise the profile and interest of rare earth spinel power cores, which I think are kind of underappreciated in the, in the field. Um, I, I think to, as proof of that, uh, I'll point out that um, I had a, originally had a, a, a slide saying uh, a, a totally unnecessary introduction to spin ice right, in this audience. Uh, it was going to be followed by a totally unnecessary introduction to 227 power cores. Uh, and I, I thought uh, by Friday on the last Friday afternoon, uh, I wouldn't have to introduce Spinel's. But now I am Friday afternoon, and nobody except for the name of Jeff Rowe has introduced Spinel, which uh, make, I'm actually aghast about, actually. Because uh, it's unfortunate, because I think um, there's a lot uh, that can be done, especially with these new rare earth Spinel's, that can contribute to the field kind of in a way that's comparable to the teaching set of And I'll, I'll take that fine. Um, so the majority of my talk is going to concentrate um, on the material I've been studying for a couple of years, magnesium, gerbium, and selenide, which um, I put on a, a, a paper on there about a year ago called um, something to the effect of dipolar spin ice in, in a rare selenide. Uh, now I put a new version of I worked on it for years and I learned more about it a year, learned more about it, and now I put a new version called uh, non-dipolar spin ice behavior. <laughs> Um, that can have 
there's two equivalent sites that can interact with each other and create a lot of interesting behavior. So the F electrons and the D electrons are notably different from the Chicago Sun Electrons. And since these local crystal fields are determine what your effective crystal system is, um, that affects the ultimate the ground state. So there's a lot of strong motivation to studying these things, um, and expectations will act different, that differently than the Chicago Sun. So if you're looking for new states matter, um, this is a good place to work. And of course we kind of know this already. Um, people don't look at spinels a lot because they think they distort. That's true, the transition modes. But the F electrons are a little bit more localized, so they tend to retain their cubic symmetry and they tend to perfect uh, power coordinates. Um, so there's a couple of examples that people might know of. Um, about 10 years ago or 8 years ago, there's a paper by uh, Lavelle et al. who showed that the material of cadmium remains selenide as a black hole spinax, so as a black hole spinax candidate. The main piece of evidence was um, a remnant paddle the entropy of the It's kind of the main experimental piece of evidence. It's been nice. Um, but because of the presence of cadmium, neutron scattering work wasn't done until just this year, and there's a nice paper just published by Gao et al. where they measured the crystal field scheme, confirmed its Isaac character, and looked at short range correlation short as this. In that paper, they also showed that there's basic susceptibility to data, but showed that the monopole hopping rate is like 200 magnitude, 300 magnitude hop faster than the growth effect. But it shows the same sort of quantum fluctuations, so that's probably going to come back. Um, the other thing that you might have heard, because it was talked about this week, is the material of uh, cadmium in terpene selenide. So Jeff Brown was talking about this in the context of his calculations in terpene spinel, corn sharing of octahedra. Um, so there was a, a nice paper last year by uh, Dan Alpe Rotier, where they showed that there's a gamma 5 covered state, which is kind of consistent with the expectation of Jeff, I believe. And then more generally, uh, there's a group paper by Eagle last year about that showed this not just neg cadmium selenide, but sulfide, they're neg these And they kind of all look like. So, me being interested in spinels and kind of averse to uh, expensive isotopes, or spending money on expensive isotopes, I uh, kind of naturally gravitated towards the magnesium. Actually, uh, we kind of came about this independently. Uh, I, I said offhand to my student a couple years ago that we should look at this material that I get rid of caveat, and he came back with a whole set of synthesized isotopes, which is nice. Um, he came across this paper by Fao, oh, oh, sorry, Mark, Mark, I'm sorry, Fao, he called? <laughs> sorry, Mike. Uh, in, in 1964, where they looked at all the ternaries, transitional rare ternaries, and there's a whole collection of different uh, structures. But for the magnesium series, you should get a cubic spinel structure from the interpium and two of the So we went ahead and synthesized what we could. Uh, we did the holmium, I didn't do it in order. We did this one first because we're actually going to spin right? So we saw magnesium, erbium, but also interpium, thulium, and holmium. Uh, we tried interpium, just rose and served on it. The teaching will never be not magnetic. So, um, I, 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 this is just x ray scattering data showing that we have the right structure um, and kind of basic for fun stuff. A couple things I should point out is um, I quite unfairly plotted this model that you couldn't see the quality of this, so I'll just acknowledge right now it's harder to make magnesium samples super pure because magnesium wants to float away. So, uh, you kind of have to accept about 5 to 10% of the purity. But the purity is always erbium selenide or some rare selenide. Um, the good news is that the material itself, the majority of it doesn't like to form defects in structures. So if you're short on magnesium, you always get phase separation into a period. So we don't have to find it to say a lot about the majority of these. The other thing I want to point out is the lattice parameters for these are about uh, 15 to 20 times larger than in the 227 uh, spin materials. So that's, they're always about 10 extras. Here they're always about 11 and a half, which effectively means for the crystal fields, they're all kind of squished down towards the elastic channel. You have more low lying crystal field expectations than you would otherwise. Okay. So, let's find the crystal fields. This determines the local, local defective spin system. Uh, so, this is the first thing we did. We went to this is this data from Sequoia, the flying, or hybrid between toxic for converts, the station neutron source. Um, on our sample with the base moments, we have the best data, so on the sample. So, you see, uh, you see crystal field expectations of the ground state, though, which show up these horizontal lines. Um, you notice that some of them are low enough that you can thermally excite them, so we need a bunch of temperatures so we can get interest side excitations. So eventually, with this material, uh, with magnesium, erbium, selenide, we have six different spectra uh, with two different temperatures, two different wavelengths, three different temperatures. We identified 24 different modes. And we fit the whole crystal field spectrum. And for those people who are interested in the details, I mean, we did Monte Carlo uh, exploration of the six dimensional parameters based on this team was operated for. The long story short, there's for six pieces of information we have 24 volts. So we really kind of nailed the magnesium-erbium selenide because it's the easiest. The other materials 
how we grew on this, it was a bit harder. So when you, you lower the intensity of these modes, you kind of get phone on expectations that are kind of the same intensity. But when you're running phone on expectations, you kind of just look at the Q dependence of these modes, and you can see ones that go up are either phone on, ones that go down are kind of uh, build expectations. And that way, we kind of got four expectations for each of these. Um, the Eternium was harder because the Eternium only theoretically has three or four, and, and one of them is always kind of weak. So we see two. So this is an under constrained problem, but we think we've got a, a solution to this. So using the uh, student operators we kind of get from these sorts of fits, we kind of come up with these projected uh, local crystal uh, schemes, crystal field schemes. Um, we have magnesium and some of the one we really nailed. You know this is a perfect Isaac system. So we have a low line chromatic that um, that's actually a dipolar optical number that's come up today. This has a special symmetry. Um, and the next high state is a four milliwatt crumbles. Um, we also have an Ising kind of doublet for the Holbein system, um, but you also have a another doublet within one millivolt of the elastic channel, and two singlets which were within another millivolt high. So almost certainly not an Ising system. Um, we have a non-magnetic singlet in the Thulium system, which is um, also has another singlet that's within one millivolt of the elastic channel. So there's a high potential for um, the low-lying electric crystal electron mode. We need to resolve these measurements by the way. So this is all kind of projected. But there's a high possibility that we're kind of hybridizing these low-lying modes of getting And so just to show that, um, we just, just for fun, I'm not going to be thinking as I said, we, we kind of treated these as uh, degenerate, they kind of read the last guidelines of the crystal field system, and we kind of got a Heisenberg like system with 14 more magneton moments, holding you know, from, from two more magnetons, um, and a, an Ising like system with 13, a D factor of 13. I'm not, not that we think these are, but I'm just saying that moment is there depending on the strength and form of the interaction between the So there's a high possibility that these things aren't what they look like just based on the independent. So the Eternium I also wanted is kind of an unconstrained system. We have two or four pieces of information, it's just, or pieces of data, six pieces of information. Uh, but we got a, a, a fit that we kind of think is our data well, and um, we kind of believe it after Jeff Rao came out with his paper, and he looked at the expectation just from scaling theory by looking some of our other compounds, and he came up with something almost the exact same number, which is amazing. So um, you should just take this with a great salt. There, there is some, this is not a great string of Okay, so um, the question that you might reasonably ask is um, if we did, an, so Steve's operator equivalent is the independent atom model, so if these uh, energies are so close, you might reasonably ask if is our, uh, our crystal field scheme uh, trustworthy? And I think the answer is different depending on the material. For the turbine, the low line gaps 25 levels, this is probably right, in so much as we know the crystal field scheme. Holy almost is certainly not. Um, Erbium is kind of on the cusp. It's a four millivolt low line mode. You might say that's not isolated enough. It's really less isolated than the Sirosian technique. But um, if the, we're down to one Kelvin, it's certainly not thermally populating. And there's not a lot of interaction to mix these. But just to build confidence that we have the right crystal speed field scheme, the way you build confidence is you take something you calculated and you use it to calculate something else. So the thing that we decided to try to calculate is the magnetization. So uh, what we did really is we, we actually have all the eigenfunctions that kind of express the information. So you, you know, no. <laughs> but we uh, we took all the eigenfunctions and we used the degenerate perturbation theory to re-diagonalize all these uh, uh, doublets and then uh, mix all the doublets with degenerate perturbation theory and then work out uh, work out the uh, partition function of the magnetization. There were 1,500 different local field directions and we kind of in the computer we found the crystal average and. We came up with these solid lines. These solid lines are the expectation for the, magnet, the powder magnetization if our crystal field scheme is correct. Overlaid with our data with no fitting parameters whatsoever. No scaling, no fitting at all. So it's not perfect, but no, it, it, it's perfect enough for you, right? And maybe we didn't, you can't even have verbal diagnosis. But I think this was a strong confirmation that our crystal field scheme is about right, which means that we really had an Ising system. Well separated that The other thing I want to point out though is among the things that we saw in doing this analysis is this kind of linear field events of high fields. So you might ask what is the effect of this four mill electron volt mode and it doesn't uh, doesn't stop you from being high like and this is it. What it does, this is a perturbative effect. This is um, 
This is the result of applied magnetic fields mixing the upper mode of the ground. So the reason I put this is because a lot of people see these linear field dependencies as well in, in the literature. It's not what you expect for a kind of a relevant function. Um, but you see this nonetheless, and it, it, what it represents is um, people destroying their eyes and think by measuring with a lot of large body fields. So there is a habit I've noticed that people are kind of using magnetization to determine whether something else is eyes and something is eyes or not. Um, this kind of shows you right away that if you have low line crystal fields, that's kind of really not a so, uh, sorry. so at low fields, what, so practically what it does is it limits the regime of uh, validity for the eye picture. So we're limited to fields below with one Tesla and measures below five. So, but in that regime, we took our heat capacity. Um, so we did heat capacity. This has been done a long time. I'm sure people have seen this a lot. We have heat capacity. We always saw this kind of shocking like anomaly. It's around one Kelvin in the system. Um, we have other contributions uh, from crystal fields, which we can calculate exactly. Phonons, which we can model by getting high temperature data, and impurities, which we can measure and subtract off. And when we do that, we can integrate up our uh, remnant entropy. And we see we do get remnant entropy that's in blue here in zero field. And if that remnant entropy is kind of relieved by small fields that don't break our eyes picture, we're careful not to apply large fields. But if not, how limited? And this is a big change from my original manuscript. We originally had bigger error bars when we thought this was a entropy. This is a non paddling entropy system. Beyond, moreover, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out well, how our system is different from the cavity emerging cell lane system, which saw paddling entropy. But when we looked at it more closely, we found out that the system isn't different from cavity emerging cell lane. Turns out in 2010, when they calculated the remnant entropy in cavity emerging cell lane, they didn't have the crystal field data. So they fit it, they did a reasonable thing, they fit it to a shocking anomaly, and they, they extract the number, which looked like palatine entropy. But now we don't have to fit everything, this has been measured by Gow about this here. So taking off this fitted value, which we're putting in the real value from the new neutron measurements, we found that the cadmium system not only does not have palatine entropy, but it matches the mag magnesium system um, almost exactly. Right. So this was exciting to us for a couple of reasons. First, it showed points to some sort of intrinsic behavior between the material class. Second, it kind of uh, eliminates disorder as a major cause of this non paling -pally entropy because uh, the magnesium samples are laundry. <laughs> so if disorder was a major factor, we wouldn't picture this to, to, to match up so nicely. So we want to know uh, a bit more about the magnetic contribution. So this is the magnetic contribution on the right hand side. The red here, this is the cadmium in there. The glass of magnesium, it matches perfectly. Um, to figure out more about this, uh, we did what people do with diacolysis, we fit it to the diacol model. This, so we went to somebody who knows more about Monte Carlo than my, I do. This is Brian Clark, he lives in Illinois. And we asked him to kind of try to fit our data with classical Monte Carlo methods. Uh, we know the diacolysis model doesn't work, nearest in the near neighbor diacolysis model doesn't work because it did we see palliation. Right, so we ruled that right away. Um, we know there's something else in the system that's lifting the degeneracy of the ice manifold. So the most obvious thing to check is the next nearest neighbor interaction. And so we use the next nearest neighbor dipole ice model and we fit it. And we got a fit that works very, very nicely. So the dipole contribution we can just lift from knowing the crystal, the crystal uh, sorry, the structure. We can get a good fit of our heat capacity data in the next nearest neighbor dipole ice model, which isn't very interesting until you kind of look at it. Look at it it's a lot smaller than the dipole contribution, but we had a couple constraints. Our nearest neighbor interactions were always ferromagnetic. Couldn't explain our data otherwise. Our next nearest neighbor interactions were always anti-ferromagnetic. We couldn't explain our data otherwise. And the next neighbor interaction uh, was always significantly larger than the near neighbor interaction, which is odd because it's seventy percent further away. And and uh, I can talk walk into the chain path. The chain path is off. So, uh, nonetheless, we would have been, we would have been uh, inclined to kind of believe this fit, describes the data very well, um, except it doesn't exist why I all our data. It's not consistent with our neutron scattering data. So, we did a bunch of diffuse neutron scattering data. At high temperature, the neutron diffuse scattering looks like a uh, form factor, which you expect from paramagnetic spins, uh, which is nice because we can fit that form factor and use it to normalize the rest of our data. And um, here we show the difference between high and low temperature data at three different temperatures. Um, normal put on absolutely, absolutely 
intensity scale. This is an absolute intensity scale. It's key because it allows us to compare to the predictions from Monte Carlo theory. So we took the parameters determined from Monte Carlo, but we calculated the structure factor associated with the spin configurations, and we plotted those in purple. So in the paramagnetic state, it describes our data fairly well. But you can see as we go down in temperature, we start missing at specifically at one position. That position is the 100 rag position, which is suspicious because this is the rag peak associated with the ordered state that we would reach if you just jacked up J2 next to your neighbor interaction for any given. So long story short, what this seems to say is that if we increase the next nearest neighbor interactions enough to describe a heat capacity data, we can't describe it. So overall, that tells us that the next nearest neighbor dipole model uh, is not sufficient to describe our data. How much time do we have? One minute, okay. So, so I'm going to talk about all these. I'll, I'll flip through these things really fast. What we've told, what I've shown you is the dipole ice model does not explain our data. And we have something else in the Hamiltonian that has to be in there. So we don't have the data to say much more than that, but we do have suspicions. Right, based on our crystal field, this is the, the, the uh, I function for a low line doublet. Um, this is actually a optical doublet that I'm not going to talk about. But what we what would, um, occurred to us when we saw this is that uh, a paper by Jeff Brown uh, published in 2015 called How Magnitude Quantum Effects of Classical Spin Essence. Where he pointed out that um, any deviation from a 15 half crystal field function creates transverse coupling terms in the effective spin system. And it goes like the size of the next Newton neighbor term over the 15 half term squared. So if we put an R data into this kind of general scaling analysis, we see about a 15% transverse coupling term. So for a for, uh, point of reference, it should be a tiny has 30%. So that's quite a bit long. Now, talking to Jeff this week, he says, he tells me, no, no, this is probably not appropriate. What's probably more appropriate is the fact that you have low-lying crystal fields and you get fluctuating crystal fields from low-lying crystal fields. And uh, so he used this to show that you have fluctuations in urban tiny because it has a signal that allows it to select uh, an order by a disorder mechanism. We have one for So this is probably in our system. Both kind of have the same effect. We have every reason to look at transverse coupling terms from the crystal field excitations in our system which shows that we don't have a classical spin but a spin quantum situation. So I'm just going to slip right to the end. Okay, I know you see there's nine there. I have three more materials I'll talk about. Just one sort of This one's the same thing. But it has possible field of states. This one's ordered as TQ, unreasonably TQ, low temperature heat capacity. But the ordered wave vector is half, 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 with no other T in the zero values, which we don't understand. The last one is our kind of Trojan technique equivalent. We have a low line double, two low line stainless. It also orders, so it looks like a lot of heat capacitors. This is all crystal field entropy with one little first order phase transition at 3.5 Kelvin. And we see a huge ordering space, first order ordering space, which we also understand. We've gone through every uh, representation of the FTP of our system. We cannot explain it. So, many other things. So, my conclusion is. Don't forget the spin else. Everything else you can read. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for a fascinating talk and speaking up at the end. So yeah, do we have any questions? Other questions? Um, the 
advertising or it's fun. The insuring the insuring income out of it. Uh, uh, that's it's the Heisenberg actually. Yeah. Mostly, I guess, a slight, slight tendency towards Heisenberg, but it seems almost. So, um, I'll point out that the Cathy American Cell IC is a gamma 5. I'll put it up in case you think have time to talk about that. I see a gamma 5 term coexisting. Uh, coexisting with a half 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 which they dismissed as disorders. But we see the half 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 peak and none of the gamma 5 peaks. And more badly in tightening, then we always see the half 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 peak, which they associate with the decoupling tag. Again, they see Q because they all order in these which we don't see. So somehow we're decoupling our tag day planes, but not, not through sort of word. At least not that you can see. It. If so, it's much, much weaker than apparently. So um, if I actually talk about this, but I'm not quite sure all of the so when you're talking about the bipolar interactions, mm -hmm. you have very large moments on the European side, right? Sure. So don't you have to have bipolar interactions that are you know, fully three-dimensional? Is, is there no way around that, right? Yes, yeah, right. We do. And it's included in the model. <coughs> so it's, 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 it's included taking you out of the and such. You're yeah, asking we did the equals. Um, yeah. Yeah, we did, we did, we did uh, 2000, 2000, 48 slice periodic under conditions with some other condition that Brian understands that's supposed to be a equal to. So why are you calling it non-dipolar? Well, I'm, I'm saying, it, I'm, ah, ah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, we have a bit past the loose with the language. I'm saying that the dipole ice model is not enough to describe our computer. So there's something else in there. Maybe, maybe yeah, I appreciate it, but more than dipole ice model. Well, I just have a comment. I stay on this side. I stay on that eraser side. Yeah, so I just have a comment here. So the, for the OEM one, this is uh, for the dipole to work out with the purpose. The common contact contains more term than just the transport skin, you know, skin interaction and other interactions. Okay. And more of the thick model of the skin. That's probably more important than the with this uh, high order effect of the data side. So, sorry, I, 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 there is a common between GSC, SD, and the transport components rather than the SX. So there's a JC, J transport. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. The end result is inducing one of the two. Well, that also leads to quantum. Yeah. Uh,